Good afternoon, New Brunswick, and welcome to today's COVID-19 update for the province. I'm Vicki Hogarth at the CHCO News Desk. Today we will be hearing from Chief Medical Officer of New Brunswick, Dr. Jennifer Russell, and Premier Blaine Higgs. Now, we've done the roll call already with the journalists, so I'm hoping that means we're starting on time. But as you know, um, we, we can always be delayed, but I'm hoping at 2.27, as is the time right now, we should be starting around the 2.30 start time that we have been anticipating all morning. Just for a quick recap of the numbers, there were 57 new cases of COVID-19 in the province yesterday. Now the breakdown in terms of zones, there were 30 in zone one, 14 in zone two, four in zone three, two in zone, oh sorry, four in zone three, three in zone four, two in zone five, zero in zone six, and four in zone seven. Overall, there are 533 active cases of COVID-19. The breakdown in terms of health zones for active cases goes like this. 215 of those are in zone one, that's the Moncton region, that is the most heavily affected zone at the moment and obviously one of the circuit breaker zones. 78 in zone two, 87 in zone three, 68 in zone four, 64 in zone five, seven in zone six, 14 in zone seven. So zone six and seven are doing quite well at the moment um, and have had the lowest case counts for at least the last while. There was another death in the province yesterday, a person over the age of 90 in zone one, the Moncton region, and that brings the total of deaths so far that we know of obviously to COVID-19 to 112 throughout the course of the pandemic. Now, if you've been following the news recently, you know that I don't want to say the vast majority, but a large, a large portion of the deaths we have experienced in the province throughout this whole pandemic have happened this fall, um, which might lead to one of the questions that I asked today. Um, I had many people write in, someone I was just actually speaking to moments ago over email, um, who was writing in about the idea of natural immunity and, and what that might mean for New Brunswick's fourth wave. Now, in, in some parts of the United States, they allow people who are, have had COVID and are now recovered to be considered a vaccinated, similar to vaccinated, to be considered immune for a certain amount of a month after having had a COVID diagnosis. They allow for that on a vaccine passport. It's not something that's currently being done in New Brunswick, but uh, that is a possible question that I might ask to Dr. Russell and the Premier, whether that's something that could be considered. And another point to make on the subject, um, which came in through, through different questions from the public this week, and one that I've thought of myself and, and have questions about is whether maybe part of our fourth wave has to do with the fact that we did so well early on. Um, could that potentially be why we're seeing so many cases now? When you, when you loosen restrictions and there's no natural immunity um, to go with the uh, number of people being vaccinated, is that a factor? I don't know what the answer is to that. So it is to put that in, in uh, a question combined with another question about um, COVID positive recoveries and, and could that be put on a vaccine passport? That's a question I'm considering asking today. Um, but since many of you are already following online and waiting for the conference to start, I'd love to hear your feedback on that topic um, and what you think. Should someone who's recovered from COVID uh, be considered immunized, for like immunized, um, and have that be able to be put on a vaccine passport as they are doing in parts of the United States? Or is that something that we should just consider being vaccinated, just that, being vaccinated and not be having been a natural recovery from uh, COVID-19? Love to hear your thoughts on it. So please feel free to write them in the chat that's going on online right now. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of you. There's over 400 already joining. Um, so again, please feel free to also write me questions that you're thinking of for today's conference. I imagine, as many of you know, we've been experiencing um, a circuit breaker in parts of the province, not exactly where we are right here in zone two. We've been, um, been free of the circuit breaker, but I'm sure that Dr. Russell and Premier Higgs will give us an update today on whether circuit breakers are being extended anywhere, if they're being stopped anywhere. Um, they'll definitely have to update us before Halloween weekend, and I'm sure that there will also be some guidelines that are addressed, and they have addressed it in conferences from last week, but we actually haven't had a COVID conference this week, so before the Halloween weekend, I'm sure that they will want to at least give an outline of um, safety protocols. If you are going to take your family trick-or-treating, 
I'm sure Dr. Russell will do this at the start of the conference. I do want to mention if you're watching in Charlotte County, that is where we are based. If you're in the St. George area tomorrow, there is going to be a free rapid test pickup site. And this starts at 10 a.m. tomorrow and that will be at the Day Adventure Center. Now they say uh, that they run until 2.30 or until supplies last. Now, if any of you were in St. Stephen this week for the free rapid test pickup on Tuesday, um, I was there with Patrick from the TV station to do a news story. We got there, I think, at quarter to 10, and there was already a huge line. Um, it moves really fast, though, so I will say if you're, if you're hoping to get a rapid test, we went through the line um, in less than five minutes. It really moved really swiftly. Uh, and they do give out one package per person in the car. So if there's two of you in the car, you each get a package. So again, if you do want more for your family, then make sure that they are with you in the car. But they will be doing the same thing in St. George on tomorrow, Friday. Um, so again, if you're looking for that and you're in the St. George area, or maybe you got some in St. Stephen, you'd like more, you can go to St. George and get them there. I know that in St. Stephen this week, there were 1,600 kits that they had. Within the first hour, 800 were given out. Um, so get there I would recommend not holding off if you're waiting to go on your lunch break it's better to go in the morning if you can just because it is a supplies last situation I don't know what I'm hoping to get to St. George tomorrow too just to see what it's like um, but what I did hear from uh, public health when I was at Tuesday's rapid test pickup site in St. Stephen and that was at the border arena they said that they will be coming back next week. So again, if you're in the St. Stephen area and you can't make it to St. George tomorrow, you can do this. You can go again this Tuesday um, and pick up rapid tests. I wish I had my kit here to show you. I haven't used it yet. I'm waiting for a, a, a tickle in my throat or something that would make me feel the need to use it. Um, I have given one to my dad who actually was on vacation. He had one uh, last week though, just because he had come away from a trip to BC and come back to New Brunswick. And we just wanted to make sure he was safe when he returned and, and he was, but it was a nice reassurance that, okay, he's back from a trip. And so he can, we can socialize with him. We felt a lot more secure about that. Even though he wasn't feeling ill, just based on the travel, it was nice to have that um, added uh, not I wouldn't say protection but you know what I mean just the added assurance that it's okay to socialize with him um, because he is vaccinated you can often carry COVID and still be vaccinated and maybe not show any symptoms we wanted to be sure so that, that's what those rapid tests are used for you get five in a kit um, and they have to I believe use once you open the kit I have to read the instructions again but I think it's about a 10-day period where you can use them um, but they do come five in a kit and uh, you can pick up one per person in the car, as I mentioned. So if you are two, if you're four, you can each get a kit and they do go fast. So what Public Health said on Tuesday when I spoke with them is that they'd be coming back at least next week to both locations. So St. Stephen Tuesday, St. George next Friday as well, St. George tomorrow. Um, again, if you are in St. George, go tomorrow um, and then they will be coming back the next week. Uh, and it could potentially go on for a few more weeks like that. So we will keep posting about it on our Facebook page. So, so follow there if you're looking for updates on when they're happening. But uh, the public health person I spoke to said um, that they would continue to go as long as they had uh, supplies to give out. And she didn't really have a, a deadline for when they'd stop doing it. So she said at least the next few weeks they would be happening regularly at these mobile free rapid test pickup sites and yes i guess another thing to stress i tried to do it in our post online is that they are free so really and it takes it took five minutes to go through the whole line even though we were there uh first thing in the morning so it, there's no wait so you don't really I'm, i i hope the same will be for saint george tomorrow but it wasn't a hassle at all um and it was great to see so many people coming out to uh to get that added layer of protection trying to follow what's happening in the online chat um, oh, say, thank you, Tanisha, saying there's an expiry date on the box, so that is good to know. I, <laughs> I haven't looked at mine too closely yet because I haven't felt the need to use it, but I, I'm sure that is the case, and maybe that's why, Tanisha, they are coming back week after week for the next little while um, to, to make sure that you can get one uh, before an expiry date. Um, let's see what else is happening. How far in the future does it? That's a good question, Jane. Jane's online, she's asking, and maybe Tanisha, maybe you can answer this in the chat. She's saying, how far in the future is the expiry date? That's a really great question. Um, I'd like to know, I haven't had to use mine yet, but I guess uh, it would be good if I don't need it to give it to someone who's maybe feeling the need if the expiry date um, is soon. 
I will just do a quick recap. If you are just joining us, I am Vicki Hogarth at the CHCO News Desk. We are about to go into today's COVID-19 update for the province, and we will be hearing from Dr. Russell today as well as Premier Higgs. There are quite a large number of journalists in the call. It's possible I will just get a chance to ask one question. Um, so please, again, if you have questions that you'd like me to ask in the conferences, please uh, feel free to write them in. I often pivot based on the information that we hear at the start of the conference. I sometimes modify my question to address the new information that we hear. But as I was mentioning, uh, I am looking at a lot of the questions that you at home wrote in this week and, and considering asking them. I have them in front of me here, so I'll tell you a little bit about one of them. The main one I mentioned that I'm considering asking is just about natural uh, immunity if you have recovered from COVID in other parts of the world, in parts of the United States. They are um, allowing someone who has recovered from COVID to be considered like, um, like someone who's been vaccinated um, and that there is a vaccine passport that allows for that for a certain amount of time. I don't know, I don't know the details of how long that is considered, um, but I'm also considering asking the idea that Perhaps could we could we have an idea of what Dr. Russell's thoughts are on New Brunswick's fourth wave and maybe the fact that we were so, so uh, safe in the first year and a half. We had very few cases of COVID here. When we opened up the province, did that mean, you know, with vaccinated people fine and as we're seeing vaccinated people can still host the virus and even um, at times get sick, uh, not in the great quantity that they do if they're not vaccinated, but still it's happening. Um, and I'll go over the hospitalization numbers and vax versus unvax in a second about that. Um, but w I'm wondering, and, and so were some people who wrote in um, why, uh, I'm trying to follow questions online too. I won't look down while I'm, I'm trying to finish a thought. Why uh, New Brunswick's fourth wave is potentially bad. Could that potentially be because we didn't have so many cases for the first year and a half? And then when we opened up um, and let go of so many of the restrictions and, and COVID obviously came in and we had a lot of travelers coming in this summer that we didn't have before that. Did it spread more like wildfire because we didn't, we had the vaccine base, but we didn't have any natural immunity. Whereas places like, let's say even in Canada, Toronto, even Alberta, um, have had so many more cases of COVID that there is some kind of invisible uh, natural herd immunity that comes from having a bigger number of, of cases of COVID. So that's a question I have. Um, but other questions that you are wondering, um, I saw one of these come in right now um, on the Facebook chat, but there is this, this antiviral pill and it's, it is done by Merck called, uh, I'm going to get it wrong, Molnupiravir. Have you heard of this? It's an antiviral pill that people that have COVID, and I think it's just in the experimental phase right now, um, or at least a study phase, um, but it's done by Merck, and it is a pill that I know that they're using it right now, I think in, in countries, developing countries, where they haven't had the best uh, vaccine rates at this point, or haven't had a vaccine availability like we have in North America. This pill can apparently, or at least the studies show at this point, um, could potentially cut some of the severity of the symptoms. Um, so that is a question I have, is, is, is this being reviewed by Health Canada and where are we at with that? Now for a time check, it's 2.40, but as you know, we sometimes start late. So bear with me, we will cut right into the conference room when the conference starts. Uh, I have my earpiece in and they let me know in the back room if they see Bruce, the moderator in the conference room, and then as soon as they tell me they see Bruce, we go right to the conference room. So if you wonder what I'm listening for, it's always for a, a cue from the back that Bruce is in the conference room, and we are going to the conference room. And again, I will follow a lot of your comments. I'm trying to follow as I go along, uh, but I can't see them all right now, but I will review them later. And I love to hear what you're thinking at home. If you want to send us an email, news at chco.tv is the best way to reach everyone on the news team. Um, there's, I think, three of us, like three or four of us that get that email. Um, and then you can also write me directly at Vicki, V I C K I dot Hogarth, H O G A R T H, at chco.tv. If you prefer to uh, not address it in a public chat or if you're just not following online and want to email me later. Let's go over some of the other numbers while we wait for Premier Higgs and Dr. Russell. In terms of our vaccination rates, 92.3% of New Brunswickers have had at least one dose, eligible New Brunswickers that is, and 84.3% have been fully vaccinated who are eligible. Now this number though drops significantly if you get into the age groups of 12 to 19 year olds. 
and 20 to 29 year olds. Those two age groups still haven't hit the 75% uh, mark fully vaccinated. Every other age group has, but it obviously goes up more greatly um, the older you get. I believe when you get to the 30 year old age group, 30 to 39, it's around 76 percent so it's it's in the 75 range that we were aiming for but it's not it's not that high and now obviously as we're we're going through the fourth wave we're realizing that a 90 percent is more what we have to aim for in terms of herd immunity um let's go over some of the numbers in terms of schools for those of you with kids in schools there have been 401 cases of covid 19 in schools since september 7th now currently there are 30 six schools that are being impacted in some way by COVID-19. Now, a question I had um, that I'm just considering um, based on questions for our, that came in from viewers at home is just what percentage of those cases are students versus staff? If we could get a better picture of basically what the Delta variant means now. Um, before, we were finding out about cases in schools this time last year, but it often wasn't to do with students. We know that's not the Good case anymore. Oh, looks like we are going into the conference room. Um, so I will see you after the conference, but please write your questions to me in the comment section while it's happening, as I will be following along with you. I will see you after the conference. Bon après-midi tout le monde et bienvenue à cette mise à jour sur le COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Speaking on behalf of the province today, in the following order are Dr. Jennifer Russell, the province's Chief Medical Officer of Health, and the Honorable Blaine Higgs, Premier of New Brunswick. Les portes paroles aujourd'hui, dans l'ordre suivant, sont la médecin hygiéniste en chef, le Dr. Jennifer Russell, et l'Honorable Blaine Higgs, Premier ministre de Nouveau-Brunswick. Dr. Russell. Bon après-midi à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. J'ai encore une fois le triste devoir de vous annoncer que deux autres personnes du Nouveau-Brunswick sont décédées des suites de la COVID-19. Je tiens à exprimer mes plus sincères condoléances à, les, à la famille des personnes décédées. Again, it is my duty to inform you that two more New Brunswickers have died due to COVID-19 and I want to extend my sincere condolences to the family, the, to the families rather, of the deceased. Despite this sad news, we are seeing hopeful signs that the fourth wave of the COVID-19 pandemic is beginning to recede. The public health measures put in place earlier this month are working. Confirmed new cases of COVID-19 across New Brunswick are trending downward despite the increase in new cases today. Active cases are declining and we are starting to see a reduction in serious illness, hospitalizations and ICU admissions. You have all made this happen. Every New Brunswicker who has followed public health guidance and advice has had a part in our success to date. Je tiens à vous remercier sincèrement pour tout ce que vous avez fait et continuez de faire afin de ralentir la propagation de la COVID-19 dans la province. I thank you most sincerely for all that you have done and continue to do to slow the spread of the COVID-19 virus in our province. But still, I have concerns. Santé publique s'inquiète également beaucoup de l'augmentation de nombre de nouveaux cas dans la zone 2, particulièrement à Saint-Jean et dans les environs. Public health is very concerned about the rise in new cases in Zone 2, particularly in the St. John and surrounding area. So we're going to show a slide, and on this slide you will see that the black line shows the growth of cases in Zone 2, where the seven-day average of new cases has been steadily rising for the past week. This region now has the highest positivity rate in the province, with cases mostly concentrated in the city of St. John and Kennebecasis Valley communities. By working together, I am confident that we can bend the curve in Zone 2, as we have done elsewhere in the province. 
Premier Higgs will speak to our response to these developments shortly. But I want to assure you that your efforts are bearing fruit, and I ask that you remain patient and vigilant as we reduce the impact of the fourth wave. Aujourd'hui, Santé publique a confirmé 69 nouveaux cas de COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Avec 51 rétablissements, le nombre de cas actifs dans la province s'élève aujourd'hui à 549. En date d'aujourd'hui, il y a 31 citoyens du Nouveau-Brunswick qui sont hospitalisés en raison de la COVID-19, dont 16 aux soins intensifs. Today, Public Health has confirmed 69 new cases of COVID-19 in New Brunswick. With 51 recoveries, the number of active cases in the province today stands at 549. Today, there are 31 New Brunswickers in hospital due to COVID-19, of whom 16 are under intensive care. The number of new cases has gone down by 50% and the number of active cases has declined by nearly one third since the circuit breakers were put into effect. And this is good news. However, our healthcare system remains under strain. And I just wanted to clarify to the public what this means, the strain to the healthcare system. So it does not mean that you're going to be denied access to acute care. But for the system to continue to provide acute care services, they've had to suspend elective surgeries and other services. One of the key measures in the circuit breaker areas is the reduction in close contacts. Remember, the COVID-19 virus doesn't move by itself. It needs people to carry it to new hosts. So when people stay in their one household bubble and avoid close contact with large groups of people, the spread of the virus is dramatically reduced. So I have another slide to speak to. And in this one, you can see the data that we've collected from our circuit breaker regions bears this out. So those tiny dots are really the, the hospitalizations trending. And you can see it's trending between the bottom curve and the second curve. And so that is a direct result. Those curves are really demonstrating what happens when the number of close contacts is reduced by a certain percentage. So the yellow line is a reduction of close contacts by 60%. And the gray line is a reduction of close contacts by 40%. And those, that trend shows a direct correlation with the impact on hospitalizations. So the blue dots, like I mentioned on the slide, are the actual hospitalizations that we've experienced, and the waves are part of that modeling. And so we, again, this is all based on what we know about people having reduced their number of close contacts. So that's really a, a great trend to see. The orange wave shows that if there was only a 20% reduction of contacts, uh, again, so that's the, the, the third line, the gray line represents 40% reduction and the yellow line 60% reduction. And the blue line demonstrates what would have happened if we had made no changes in our um, hospital, or rather in, in, in our contact, close contacts and uh, in what the hospitalizations for COVID-19 would have looked like. And literally, you can see they would have soared to over 100 cases, more than three times the current number. But with the circuit measures, the circuit breaker measures rather, and the actions that the majority of New Brunswickers have taken to reduce their number of contacts, you can see that the contacts between individuals were reduced. And this has led to a corresponding decline in hospitalizations. So I think we can all be pleased that these measures are working. And again, I want to thank New Brunswickers who are by and large abiding by them. Bien que les mesures coupe circuit se montrent efficaces, le plus important geste que peuvent poser tous les citoyens du Nouveau-Brunswick est de s'assurer qu'ils sont pleinement vaccinés contre le COVID-19. Vous pouvez contracter le virus même si vous êtes vacciné et de plus En plus, les, les gens pleinement vaccinés contractent le virus. La bonne nouvelle, cependant, c'est qu'une personne pleinement vaccinée qui contracte le virus est beaucoup moins à risque de devenir gravement malade et d'avoir besoin de soins intensifs. We have begun providing booster shots. Two priority groups, beginning with those who were vaccinated first and are most vulnerable to the impacts of the virus. 
We have provided additional protection to nursing home residents, the immune compromised in health care and long-term care staff. Beginning the week of November 1st, people 65 and older and school personnel will be able to book an appointment to receive an mRNA COVID-19 booster dose if six months have passed since their second dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. Additionally, those who have received one or two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine will be able to book an appointment to receive an mRNA COVID-19 booster if, it's 28 days have, if 28 days have passed since their second dose. We're also making plans for the immunization of children ages 5 to 11 when Health Canada approves a vaccine for this group. We will be ready to immunize the 54,000 children in this age group as soon as we have approval from the federal authorities so that our children can be effectively protected against the virus. In the months ahead, we will also provide booster shots to the general public based on the evidence of vaccine effectiveness. To date, we believe that most vaccinated New Brunswickers are still fully protected by the vaccine as less than six months have passed since they were fully vaccinated. But public health is aware that boosters will eventually be required and we will have a plan in place to make this happen. Now for the children out there, this Sunday is Halloween and I know that this is a very exciting time for children and their parents. And I do want to thank everyone uh, again for following all the public health measures and advice thus far. And I do want people to be able to enjoy trick-or-treating, but please do it safely. Keep your contacts with others as small as possible, particularly in the circuit breaker zones where you should go out only with your household bubble. I also suggest that people avoid being in close contact when handing out treats. We are still in, a, in the midst of a global pandemic, so we have to do things as we need to in order to keep ourselves and our families healthy and safe. We are getting positive results from the restrictions now in place. They are working because you are making them work. So please keep doing what you are doing by following public health advice, being kind to yourselves and to others and keeping hope for the future. We will get through this. And we are getting through this. But again, we do need to keep working together. Thank you very much. Merci. Bonjour. Good afternoon. I was saddened once again to learn that we have lost two more people as a result of COVID-19. The last few weeks have been tough on our province, as we have taken this, but we've taken the steps necessary and the steps that were needed to reduce the spread of the Delta variant. C'est particulièrement vrai pour les personnes qui demeurent dans la région où une majeure coupe circuit est en place. Ces communautés ont été identifiées comme étant à plus haut risque. Et c'est pourquoi il était nécessaire d'adopter d'autres mesures pour assurer la sécurité des résidents. In some areas, those measures took effect on October 8th. Then they were extended on October 26 for another seven days. The areas included much of the COVID of Zone 1, the Moncton region, the northern portion of Zone 3, the Fredericton region, and all of Zone 4, the Edmondson region. On October 22nd, the circuit breaker measures were also expanded to include all of Zone 5, the Camelton region. The actions we have taken have had a positive impact. We went from over 1,000 active cases to 549 active cases today. We went from a high of 68 in hospital to 31 people in the hospital today. We also went from 31 people in ICU to 16 in ICU today. Of the 16 in ICU, 12 are unvaccinated. However, our hospitals are still under pressure with 120 regional health authority staff absent due to COVID related reasons. There are limitations to admitting patients in units designated as hot zones, such as surgical units at the Dr. Everett Chalmers Hospital here in Fredericton and the Emmiston Regional Hospital. As well, additional cases in shelters and long-term care facilities increases the risk of hospitalizations. As you may recall, we felt we could move away from emergency measures once we reached 10 or fewer people in hospital. We have not yet reached that point. 
Therefore, we have decided to extend the circuit breaker in all of these areas for at least another seven days. As well, as Dr. Russell explained, the cases in these areas are part of a sustained trend and currently zone two, the St. John region has the highest positivity rate in the province. That is why the circuit breaker measures will be expanded to include areas of zone two. The areas impacted are New River Beach and La Pro to the west of the zone, north to the communities of Clarendon and Wellsford, east to the community of Head of Mill Stream, and including all communities in St. John and Kings counties. The 14 day circuit breaker in zone two will come into effect as of tomorrow at 6 p.m. The circuit breaker restrictions limiting your contacts to single household, which includes individuals living together, caregivers for any member of the household, and any parent, child, sibling, grandparent, or grandchild living outside the household who requires support. Tout raisonnablement à l'intérieur ou à l'extérieur est interdit. 47% of all exposures between October 12th and October 26th were related to household contacts of previous cases. That is nearly half of all exposures. Les déplacements à destination ou en province, provenance des régions ou en major coupe circuit et en place sont limités, à l'exception des personnes qui doivent se déplacer pour des raisons essentielles comme le travail, les services de santé, la garde d'enfants, les services de garde d'enfants, ou l'éducation post-secondaire et l'exception des personnes qui vont à des événements ou un prouve de vaccination est recueilli. All schools will remain open unless advised otherwise by public health. Students in circuit breaker communities can participate in school sports and extracurricular activities following the health and safety school guidelines. Teams and extracurricular groups are permitted to travel within New Brunswick, including travel in and out of circuit breaker communities. All these activities continue to be subject to the guidance provided in the mandatory order. Spectators are permitted to attend school related events provided they follow masking, physical distancing, and any other operational requirements set out by schools or districts. All events will require the cooperation and support of families and community volunteers. Should not enough members of the community volunteer to help manage events, individual schools and school districts may choose not to allow spectators. Businesses, entertainment centers and events may remain open and can continue to admit people who show proof of full vaccination and a government issued ID. Children under 12, accompanied by a fully vaccinated adult, will also be admitted. Je remercie toutes les personnes qui continuent de respecter les mesures en place et qui prennent les mesures nécessaires pour se protéger et pour protéger leurs proches et leur communauté. What is being asked of you is necessary and is important if we want to keep New Brunswickers safe. We have done well getting control of this outbreak. Now is not the time to ease our efforts. We currently have 84.5% of our population fully vaccinated and 92.4% have one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. I cannot stress enough that getting vaccinated as well as following the measures in place where you are living is crucial to your health and our success as a province. COVID is here to stay, and we must find ways to carry on our lives as normally as possible. And I believe we are doing that. Across our province, staff at long-term care facilities are taking COVID-19 seriously, and they have stepped up to get vaccinated and protect the people in their care. Of the 544 facilities in New Brunswick, 194 are 100% vaccinated, and more than half 302 long-term care facilities have a vaccination rate of 90% or above. Je remercie toutes les personnes qui fournissent leur pas d'effort. Nous allons continuer à travailler avec le personnel des établissements de soins de longue durée pour atteindre 
un objectif de vaccination de 100%. Every parent wants her child to be safe and healthy and protected from unnecessary illness. That is why it is so important that when children bring rapid test kits home from school, that their parents ensure that the test is taken properly. This ensures the child who has COVID-19 gets proper care. C'est là pour mettre aussi de se chauffer et que l'enfant n'expose pas les les autres enfants et le personnel de l'école au virus. Nous voulons aussi prévenir que des enfants soient stigmatisés à l'école parce qu'ils ils doivent présenter leurs résultats négatifs chaque jour. As a result, we will be moving away from the require uh, from requiring close contacts of school cases to bring their negative POC tests to school every day. However, we will also need to have absolute confidence that the tests are being performed at home. To ensure this happens, the mandatory order will be updated to include a provision that makes it a findable offense to falsify or deliberately misrepresent the results of the PC. POCT test. After two negative rapid test results, the child can return to school. If the results are positive, it is, it is the parent's responsibility to ensure that the PCR test is booked immediately to confirm the results. The child must isolate until they receive a negative PCR test result. Today's news about the extended and expanded circuit breakers may feel like a setback, but in reality, it is a cautionary move to ensure that our case counts do not get away from us, that our hospitalizations continue to improve, that we continue to manage COVID within the system of our healthcare network that has done so well thus far and continues to do so. Nous réalisons des progrès et avec votre aide, nous allons continuer à progresser. Cette pandémie nous a appris qu'il y a des moments et nous devrons agir rapidement et d'autres moments et il y a préférable d'adopter une approche plus prudente. I encourage everyone to remain patient, follow the measures in place and remember that we, we must continue to work together to get through this challenging time. We can look around us and be so thankful for the position that we are in, but more importantly, the position that we're moving towards. We will be able to manage not only this outbreak, but future outbreaks. And we will do so by continuing to maintain the 90% plus vaccination levels and looking to reach those soon and to continue to get third doses as required in order to maintain the health of our citizens while at the same time reflecting that there's 10% roughly of our population that are refusing to get vaccinated. We must make up for that difference and we must continue to be diligent. The fact that we have 92 plus percent with a single dose gives me great confidence that we as a population will be able to maintain uh, the required herd immunity and we can continue to grow together. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Premier ministre et Dr. Russell. Thank you, Premier and Dr. Russell. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux périodes de questions avec les membres de Média. Vous avez le droit de poser votre question dans la langue officielle de votre choix. We'll now proceed to question period with members of the media. You have the right to pose your question in the official language of your choice. Each reporter will have one question. Chaque journaliste aura une question. We will begin with Travis Fortnum of Global TV. Hey there, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Uh, not sure who wants to address this. Uh, obviously, there, there's been a lot of buzz in Zone 2 uh, around a church leader who is, uh, for lack of a better term, been shirking some of the COVID restrictions. Uh, I think that there's going to be a natural line drawn between rises in cases and now the introduced circuit breaker there and and those events. Wondering if how you would address that. Travis. 
Hi, Travis. I'll start, and then if the Premier wants to add. Um, I have been in touch with um, the regional staff in Zone 2 uh, about many of the different situations that are happening concurrently. Um, and my understanding is there has been an outreach with respect to communication and education um, and collaboration and engagement. So uh, whatever happens moving forward, uh, again, I, I've had some great conversations with staff in the region who have really done a great job. Uh, and I know other um, folks as well have been having those types of conversations. So at this point in time, again, we will move forward with the measures that we have and continue to um, encourage and engage and have those conversations. Thank you. Vicki Hogarth, CHCO TV. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Dr. Russell, if an unvaccinated person recovers from COVID-19, how does their immunity compare to someone who's been fully vaccinated? And should a person who uh, get vaccinated if they've just recently recovered from COVID? And sorry to make this long, but should our passports also, our vaccine passports also reflect um, recoveries from COVID-19? Hi, Vicki. Thank you for that question. I have um, had people ask that question and I had the information in my head and it escapes me now in terms of how long you have to wait after you've recovered. There, there is a time frame and I'll, I'll get that for you. I can't remember how many days it is, uh, but you aren't really considered immune after you've had uh, COVID. You do have to get vaccinated for many different reasons. Um, uh, including the fact that you can get reinfected with COVID. There are different strains and we have seen infections uh, of COVID in people who have previously had COVID, uh, et cetera. So uh, at this point in time, that is our recommendation, but I will get back to you with the exact time frame uh, after which somebody's recovered from COVID. Thank you. Pascal Rochnog, Radio Canada. Bonjour, ma question est pour uh, la médecin hygiéniste en chef. Euh, Docteur Russell, euh, je vais vous poser la même question que la semaine dernière. Euh, Qu'est-ce qui, qu qui sont des éléments déclencheurs qui vont vous convaincre de lever des mesures coupe-circuit, euh, entre autres dans le nord-ouest et le sud-est, euh, en termes d'hospitalisation ou de nouveaux cas ou de cas actifs? Alors, c'est vraiment un... Euh, euh, un euh, prendre toutes les informations ensemble euh, au niveau de la province et aussi au niveau de, de les zones. Parce qu'on sait que le système de santé, euh, on partage beaucoup à, entre horizon et vitalité à ce moment-ci. Alors, s'il y a des, des défis dans un des de réseaux, euh, il y a de la capacité dans l'autre, ils vont faire les échanges de patients comme, comme si c'est nécessaire. Alors, s'il y a des, des éclosions dans plusieurs endroits en même temps, si on voit la transmission euh, qui, qui, qui ralentisse pas, euh, s'il y a des, des groupes qui sont vulnérables, etc. Alors, les, les déclencheurs comme tels, c'est vraiment de garder toutes les informations en même temps euh, avant de vraiment être satisfait qu'on on, on va continuer à diminuer les risques pour les taux d'hospitalisation, parce que c'est ça le, le mesure critique à ce moment-ci. C'est combien de personnes sont dans les hôpitaux, dans les soins intensifs. Et comme vous le savez, les deux réseaux ont... ont euh, C'était nécessaire dans tous les deux réseaux de changer le, le niveau de service qu'ils pouvaient offrir à les, à les citoyens. Alors, vous savez que dans certaines situations, c'était nécessaire d'arrêter toutes les chirurgies, à changer des services qui étaient euh, offerts. Alors, euh, quand la situation améliore dans le, dans le, dans le, le sens qu'on pourrait continuer, à, on, on pourrait recommencer à offrir des services euh, euh, qui étaient offerts avant cette, euh, ces éclosions, euh, c'est ça, la trajectoire dans la bonne direction, la stabilité, les choses comme ça. Merci beaucoup. Nathan DeLong, Miramichi leader. Good afternoon. My question is for Premier Higgs. Mr. Premier, I'm hearing a lot of questions and concerns in the Miramichi area about the looming provincial by-elections in the Miramichi Bay Nigwak and Southwest Miramichi Bay to Vin ridings and when they might be called, along with concerns about a lack of representation in these ridings. Is there any more certainty or has there been any more certainty since the last time we spoke about this on when you plan to set the dates for these by-elections? Uh, 
as I understand that the concerns about COVID may be playing a factor as well. Well, certainly it is playing a factor, a, a crucial factor, and we, we need to, um, you know, I guess continue to ensure the area is represented, but, but I don't see making any decision on that um, probably before the new year. And it will be directly related to where our province is in in in, uh, in dealing with this current fourth wave, and and what it looks like going forward. So I, I I'm, I'm unfortunately I can't offer any more certainty than the last time, but that uh, it is dependent on on where we are with COVID as part of the decision making process. Thank you. We're yep. going to go to Adam Harris, please, of Brunswick News. Thanks, Bruce. Um, question for the both of you, if you could. Um, I just want an update on the Johnson & Johnson shots that New Brunswick has asked the federal government for. Um, have you received any? Um, how many have you asked for? And how are you going to deploy them? Are they going to go to particular people, uh, in individuals in particular? Yes, my understanding is we will be receiving about 500 doses is my understanding at this point in time and we are putting a plan together uh, at this moment and we can provide more details on that uh, as we get them. Thank you. We're going to go to Laura Brown with CTV. Hi there. Um, to either of you, um, my I guess observation and, and others have been observing this as well is that many of the cases over the last month have been under investigation. Um, at least initially. Um, there's not really a lot of follow-up after that. I'm wondering how are contact tracers doing um, after the last month of influx of cases? And, and are more, um, have more been, you know, figured out, contacted, and uh, they're no longer under investigation? Hi, Laura. So um, obviously the higher the case count, the more difficult the contact tracing becomes, um, but the contact tracing is still occurring and uh, we've utilized uh, many extra resources to make that happen. Um, for those people who, um, some of those cases that were under investigation, um, they're, they've now recovered. Um, and, but there is, uh, we do see community transmission uh, in several areas around the province. So that is something that we're dealing with and, um, and people have to be aware again by following all the public health measures that are in place, whether you're in a circuit breaker zone or not, it's really, really important and getting your vaccine is really important. Thank you. We're going to go to Bobby Jean McKinnon of CBC. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Russell, can you tell us more about the province's rollout plan for vaccines for children aged 5 to 10 once one becomes available? And how do you plan to address vaccine hesitancy among parents, please? So we have um, received a really great presentation recently by our communications team. Um, and uh, so that's very uh, great news. And we've been in conversations with our partners at the national level um, uh, in terms of what's going to happen uh, federally with the availability of the vaccines. And, and uh, so when all of that is finalized, we actually have our plan in place to roll that out. We know that about 50% of parents are ready and waiting for that vaccine for their children at this time. Uh, for those people above and beyond um, uh, those percentages, we do know that um, parents have a lot of questions that they need answered. So part of our plan is going to be making sure that we have um, a rollout that involves having factual information available to all parents. And, um, and a lot of that engagement will happen perhaps in local communities and areas with local representatives uh, and local uh, healthcare providers uh, helping us amplify those messages uh, at the local level. So uh, we're looking forward to this rollout. Um, there's a lot of thought that's been, gone, that's been going into it. And uh, so parents can look forward to that uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you, Ms. McKinnon. Simon Delat, Lacadie Nouvelle. Je n'ai pas de questions aujourd'hui. Merci, Simon. On va passer à Natalie Sturgeon. We'll go to Natalie Sturgeon with Global. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Um, uh, a bit off topic, if, if you'll permit me, but um, it, in, in 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada said back to work legislation uh, is goes against the Constitution. It's a constitutional right to strike. In your decision, 
or, or in your pending decisions to do back to work legislation under the emergency order, did that factor in and are you prepared potentially for any sort of suits that might follow if you have to force QP workers back to the job? Well, certainly I'm uh, I'm hopeful that that won't be required and we won't have a situation where um, we see a strike happening during a pandemic and certainly during a time when there's an emergency order in place. Now that would particularly apply to hospitals. Uh, the emergency order is put in place for the health and safety of, of New Brunswickers, but it could apply anywhere based on what the health risks were at the time. I, I don't take this um, lightly. I don't take the situation, you know, that we're in emergency order and, and that I could use it. it. It's 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 only if if we are in a situation where the health of, of New Brunswickers are put at risk and, and we find it necessary to put special measures in place in order to minimize that risk. And and that has been something that has been applied all through COVID. So um, if I have to do it based on that, we would do it. Um, because of the rationale that the, the the same rationale that was used throughout the entire pandemic, uh, it will be indeed for the health and safety of the province and the citizens. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Ms. Sturgeon. We're going to go to Erica Butler with CHMA. Erica. We'll move on to Miriam Lafontaine with CBC. Hello, uh, this is to Premier Higgs. I was wondering how many public sector employees are still not fully vaccinated and what the contingency plan is in place uh, for them, especially um, considering the ones in the healthcare sector. So currently, you know, we're following the provincial average that it's in around 10% of public sector workers are, are not uh, vaccinated at this time. The, uh, that ranges through different, different um, parts of, of government, um, parts one, two, three, and four. It ranges from um, a vaccination level as, um, as high as 93% um, to some as, as low as, let's say, 89%. Um, so, so roughly average, I say, of 10%. We are currently working through um, what that impact that has, and to your point, most notably on the health sector, um, should it be required um, to implement the, the rules that are put in place regarding mandatory vaccinations. Thank you. Savannah Odd, Telegraph Journal. Hi there, can you hear me? A little louder, but yes. Okay, um, my question is for the Premier. Um, it's also a bit off topic. Uh, on the official Language Commissioner's annual report yesterday, um, in the past two years, the Premier's office has seen 19 complaints against it, um, which is significantly more than the office has seen in any year, and it's more than the total between 2003 and 2018 against the office. So my question is, what do you think the barrier or barriers have been in the Premier's office to providing service in both official languages and how will you address it? So you're suggesting that we had 19 complaints in, a, in, the, in the most significant pandemic that we've ever experienced in the country and in the province, um, in the entire world for that matter. And that's, um, you know, I think we've done very well. I know that in relation to the uh, polling that we did across the province, our uh, communications was rated at 90 plus percent um, in the height of uh, the pandemic before the fourth wave. And, and it was certainly much to the, you know, the, the credit of Dr. Russell and, and the team that, that we were working with to ensure that every communication we had was fully bilingual. And, and that's the advantage of being in a bilingual province where we can utilize all the resources including simultaneous translation to get the message out across our entire province. Um, we followed certainly the, the rules to recognize the, the importance of communicating in both official languages. And, um, and I feel that we certainly respected those rules uh, throughout the entire 
pandemic and we still do that. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Monsieur, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you to the members of the media and everyone for joining us. That concludes today's update. That concludes today's COVID-19 update for New Brunswick with Premier Higgs and Dr. Russell. Now, if you are following along online, or if you're watching at home and you are in zone two, I know there wasn't a lot of clarity. That's a lot of the feedback I was getting from you at home. It was going to be my, my second question if we had had the chance to ask two questions today was to get a little clarity on where exactly is this new two week circuit breaker in zone two, especially if you are in Charlotte County like I am, you're wondering where does that apply? Um, I just wrote Bruce now. I will actually refresh my email while I help. Oh, here he is. He says, um, Oh, he says, wait for the release. <laughs> I guess that's coming out this moment. Uh, he said he's going to send a map out right now with all the information in it. So what I'm going to do is post that to you on online um, in the next few minutes, just giving you a detailed uh, look at where exactly this new Zone 2 circuit, daker, circuit breaker, my excuse, excuse me, um, will be in Zone 2 and whether that includes Charlotte County. Um, and again, the circuit breaker in the other zones in the province have been extended a week as well. So if you are currently in a circuit breaker that is ongoing and zone two, well, that's what you have to look forward to for the next two weeks. And I will post the details very shortly. I appreciate you watching with us today. I am Vicki Hogarth at the CHCO News Desk. I will join you here again next time. This has been a news and public affairs production of CHCO TV, New Brunswick's only source for independent community television.